How or when do you insert myofascial release techniques into a singing lesson or coaching session? Um, when when I feel I need to, and, and, and by that I I think that's when I come across something that I can't, uh, for want of a better term, quote unquote, fix with um, with a uh, an, an exercise, a vocal exercise. So if I'm running a, a piece with a performer and we get to a sticky point and they keep cracking, or they there's a there's some kind of uh, we want the sound to be different but we can't achieve that together then what I will do is I will stop the session put my hands on them uh, and see if we can find a, a change or, or a difference there I would say 50% of the time that we create the change that's that's desired um, and I would say the other 50% of the time we create a change somewhere totally different <laughs> um, that neither of us know is going to happen uh, which I think is also really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, it, as well, that everyone who comes to sing with me signs off, we, we do a history, whether they're coming to sing with me and just sing and just as a vocal coach, or whether they're coming to the clinic, um, everyone signs off on, so I've taken history, got the signature and explained that this is the, the, the paradigm I work from as a coach. Um, so I think that's important to yeah. just add in there. Yeah. And in terms of, uh, I, you know, I'm going to be blunt with this one. Yeah. I don't do singing le lessons or, or, or coaching, um, but that the, the voice, whether it's a spoken voice or singing voice, often becomes a part of, of my treatment sessions. Not that I'm coaching them into doing it differently, but I, I'll have them sing or talk or whatever it is that brought them into my clinic while we're doing the work so they can not only hear it but then internalize and because and, there's usually as much of a felt sense that is, is an auditory mm -hmm. sense so I'm not adding that layer of coaching like you are but I'm bringing into the full context of you know we're not just doing this passive um, intervention let's bring that person into action when we're doing the treatment and that seems to have boosted outcomes so to speak. What's interesting is with the kind of laryngeal manual therapy laryngeal manipulation a lot of it is done in silence Mm -hmm. uh, and then the effects are felt after right, the right. 45 minutes right. usually. Yeah, um, and I think it's a decent model. I just think that it doesn't have to be the model. No, I mean, no. There's all different ways and, you know, I, we tend to use our model that we're comfortable with, but I think having a bunch of models um, available to you and I so that we can meet the needs of every individual that comes in the room, or at yeah. least as many individuals, because yeah, yeah, yeah. right? one person might respond well to the silence approach and the other needs the constant reinforcement of, of feeling and hearing and getting that constant feedback through their own loop. So um, I think we can skip the next one. Yeah. 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 What impact on the voice have you noticed when working with singers or professional voice users? I'll start. Uh, I think the most that I usually see are changing upper and lower range, ability to reach up clear with less strain, mm -hmm. as well as the lower ranges. Except I, um, whenever I teach the class, we always, my, my, my seminars, we try and always bring um, real volunteers with real issues in. And we had a woman come in and she was a singer, but her issue was in mid range, which was really fascinating because it wasn't reaching or you know one or the other and it was when she hit a certain mid-range pinch that that or um i don't use the words like you, you do but she hit that mid-range and that's where she lost it so we just you know we sat her up we i got behind her i put the pressure um light pressure into the higher region we had her work her way up and down she found the spot she heard it she felt it and then we we, we, we messed around, as I say, right? We, we played a bit until she felt like I was connecting with that mid-range problem that only she could define and describe, and we simply held the stretch. And whether, again, what's really happening under the skin, was I stretching something that was tight, or was I simply holding her in place to allow her brain to process that and maybe change the outcome, right? The concept mm -hmm. of descending modulation, the brain making the decision that, okay, we can have other options here. Can we change the output? And that's basically an explanation for a lot of neurological changes, simple, not simple, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. descending modulation happening. And I think that's probably what was happening as I held her in that space so that she could see and hear and feel that 
that's that place right there. You're replicating it right right now, Walt, and that's what I try to seek out in all my interventions.